Hello, and welcome to In the Kitchen with Brett Thorne, a food service industry podcast by Nations Restaurant News and Restaurant Hospitality. I'm your host, Senior Food and Beverage Editor Brett Thorne, coming to you, as I usually am, from Brooklyn, where it is one of those days that it's not exactly terrible outside, but it's kind of cold, it's kind of damp, it's a little drizzly. A a day that, like, in the grand scheme of things isn't terrible, but not something that fosters happiness. And so I want to talk to you very briefly about a complaint that I have about restaurants that is minor, but that maybe together we can help solve it. And it has to do with doors. You're familiar with them, right? You, You pull them open to enter a place, and then ideally you then pull them shut so that whatever's going on beyond those doors doesn't interfere with what's going on on your side of the door. In cold months, in temperate climates, there's a tendency of people, when they go into a restaurant, to open the door and not necessarily walk in right away, but to sort of look around or finish a text or otherwise do things that keep the door open and cause whatever inclement weather is happening outside to come inside coming inside to restaurants whose operators have spent a lot of money and effort to control the temperature to make it a pleasant place for you to spend your time. And whenever customers who seem to have forgotten how doors work, specifically how you're supposed to close them after you use them, they damage the environment. There are many restaurants in temperate climates that even set up a separate door the main door to the restaurant, and then there's another one with a little vestibule so that you can open the vestibule door and then close it and then open the main door and then you go inside the restaurant without letting in the weather from outside. I don't want to belabor the point too much because this seems obvious, but many people, when they go into a restaurant, don't seem to be aware of how that little vestibule vestibule works. So they open the door and then they keep that door open as their friends come in and they open the other door so that both the doors are open, giving everybody inside a blast of Arctic chill, possibly a little bit of nerve damage, certainly a very tiny amount of psychological trauma. It's such a minor thing, really, that I guess it doesn't need to, to be something that we create a whole campaign over. Remember, idiot, close the door. But I'd like to figure out a way to solve this. So if you have any suggestions, send me an email at brett.thorn at informa.com and maybe we can find a way to teach customers how to use a door. I'm thinking of these little effects these efforts that can be made to make people's lives a little bit better, to shield them from the storms, physical or otherwise, going out in the world that you don't want to be exposed to in a restaurant where you want to be restored and to relax and have a nice time with whoever you're eating with or drinking with. And we discussed this a little bit, my guest and I, Uh, who is Gail Peary, the chef and owner of Foreign Cinema, a restaurant in San Francisco's Mission District uh, that is about to celebrate its 25th anniversary, uh, which is quite a feat. And and we talked about how she creates a uh, safe space, let's say, for her guests to have a wonderful experience. Uh, obviously, being in San Francisco, she is concerned about the environment and sustainability. So we, we talked about uh, new oil that she's using that is derived from algae and produced just on the other side of uh, San Francisco Bay in Alameda, California. It's a nice conversation. I hope that it is pleasant and soothing for you and that you'll stay tuned and listen because right now, here is Gail Perry. Hello, Gail Peary. How you doing? 
Hello, Brett. How are you? I'm great. Happy to be with I'm, you. And I'm happy to be with you. Uh, you are the chef of foreign cinema and have been for quite a little while, right? That is correct. I'm in partnership with my my best friend, John Clark, and we've been at it for about 25 years. Wow, nice going. Uh, it, yeah, it's been a journey. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about foreign cinema? Absolutely. Uh, foreign cinema is located in the heart of the Mission District and was in built in 1999. Uh, built and open in 1999, which is unheard of today. And it comprises um, m m many sites um, within our footprint. And it has been converted into one uh, beautiful kind of oasis that is not necessarily seen from Mission Street. So um, when you walk through the doors, you're not quite understanding what will be ahead of you. And what you end up finding is a beautiful courtyard for alfresco dining adjacent to a big, beautiful indoor dining room and a huge gallery called Modernism West and a big open kitchen and two bars and a DJ bar that we like to call Laszlo. And so we're all sort of connected in these beautiful, you know, different spaces. And we have been going at this place for about 25 years this year. And it's a daily written menu. And we try and uh, seduce all the senses. And part of what we do here at the restaurant is we show 35 millimeter film. And we have an old projector and an amp. All these things have come from other places in San Francisco. So it's very historical in the sense that we are keeping that spirit of film alive, especially in the 35 millimeter realm. And that's, that just happens every day. And we write the menu every day. And we like to put what, on, what is on the menu, what we love to eat. So um, we're happy to be here. We used to be like the scrappy underdogs. And now we find ourselves, <laughs> you know, still here at, at 25. So it's pretty shocking. Well, and, and the mission has transformed a lot since then, as I understand it, right? It was sort of transitional, probably, when you opened. Would you, is that accurate? Well, probably. And I think in 1999, there was the first uh, dot-com experience where a lot of speculative money was pouring into the city, the entire city. And um, so certainly that flow of energy and cash flow, which really didn't quite pencil out when the dot com bus came. Um, certainly part it really is a metaphor for San Francisco, part of that boom and bust situation. But I mean the the mission has always been a transitional place. Um, it used to be full of uh immigrants of every persuasion and uh it is always in a flow of transition and I like to call it renaissance and it's always being reborn and so the fact that we are here for 25 years and been watching things change um, yes there there has been a ton of change but there are some basic fundamentals that still are very uh, prevalent and authentic and still here and so the community is really uh, quite a dynamic uh, sensibility here. So I, I think that we've served the community. I think that our um, testament to supporting the community is here. We also employ 85% of our employees, our mission district residents, or maybe it's 79%, but a lot of people live right here in the community. So we've employed multi-generations of people here. So um, we're very proud of that. So I think um, there has been a lot of change. And what we um, are so proud to be here, embodying the idea of cinema and food and community. That's great. And you know, I, I dined at 
uh, foreign cinema quite a while ago. It was probably 10, 15 years, probably more than that, probably 15 years ago. And I ate alfresco. I don't remember what film was playing, but I, I remember having a nice time and a good meal. Well, that's wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. We, we got to get you back in. Yes, yes. I should be in San Francisco more often anyway, because it's a great city and I always enjoy visiting it. It is and, a great uh, city. It is great. Yes. People, people have been dunking on it lately, but I, I really enjoy San Francisco. Yeah, I think, uh, I think time will tell that uh, for, a, for a long time in this post-pandemic period, San Francisco has just been under a microscope. Problems that affect every American city um, have, you know, Los Angeles, uh, Denver, uh, Florida, cities in Florida, cities in all over the country have the same problems. But for some reason, you know, the nation and the globe just loves to dump on San Francisco. And I, I'm so exhausted from it because it is a false narrative. Um, and good things do happen here. But I think it's the negative that uh, tends to sell papers and clickbait. So I, I you know, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I am a little tired of being the punching bag, as I, I know a lot of it. restaurateurs are. Oh, for sure. And uh, yeah, the restaurant industry is often the punching bag for a lot of things for oh, people yes. who don't know what they're talking about. Right. It's, I mean, uh, not that it's a, not that it's it's a perfect industry by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, it, it's a, it's a microcosm of society, and it actually employs. I don't know what large percentage of the population works in food service. A lot. Yes. Well, I think service and hospitality are incredible. Are, are very much incredible, uh, viable careers. And um, they can, th these careers can actually help foster other artistic endeavors or educational work that a lot of individuals are doing. So it's a, it's a really an industry that is um, very uh, attractive and um, wor worthy and worthwhile. Yeah, you Plus, can go I mean, there. restaurants they 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 feed they feed the romantic side and the fundamental nourishment side of any city, and uh, it provides great escape uh, from the everyday politically charged world that we live in, where it's on your phone, it's and it's on, in on the news. You just we just need to escape all this political. Um, noise because i think it's actually destructive <laughs> at this oh, point sure. i mean at some point we just can't focus everything on the political um temperament of what's happening each day i it's exhausting i think we need to focus on the arts and there's actually so much good news coming out of san francisco it it's kind of aggravating but that's another time <laughs> well you know the speaking of other things looming on the horizon i was uh talking to ChatGPT yesterday. Uh, oh. for, I like to experiment with the AI, figure out what it's useful for. And I was joking with it. The thing about ChatGPT is it's always positive. Hi, how can I help you? What can I do? Uh, and, I'd you like know, to solve your problem. Right, how can I do that? And so I suggested uh, to ChatGPT that I could take the, my laptop with me to a restaurant and we, you know, we could hang out in the restaurant. And ChatGPT said, well, that would be an unusual approach. And, and instead, perhaps you should focus on the meal and enjoy the experience. And I, I was like, I like the cut of your jib, ChatGPT. You are correct. That is how you should go to a restaurant. You should go there, turn off the outside world, sit down, and have a nice meal with the people you're eating with. Or with yourself, if you're eating alone. Yes. Couldn't agree 100% more with you. And, and uh, so, so when you're here, we like to indulge you in the escape and our sense of hospitality and food and environment really is a passionate commitment on our part. Awesome. When you have, you said most of your staff, maybe 79%, whatever percentage is local from, from that very neighborhood, which yes. certainly helps with commuting. Um, so what do you do to keep your staff? What kind of uh, uh, encouragement and incentives do you give to keep them? Well, I think um, we've always tried to be good employers. 
Um, always, as employees, we always remembered when we were working with a good employer and when we were working with a not good employer. And so we use that experience all the time. Uh, I think we're uh, an environment that is uh, dynamic and um, proprietary. And, um, you know, I think we, we know who we are and we know how we uh, treat people. And so I, even in the pandemic, um, you know, we made sure everybody was taken care of. <laughs> we took care of everybody's insurance. We have private insurance. Um, Very nice. We fed people. We provided meals during that entire closure. We helped people with their landlord issues. We provided loans. So there's a lot of what an employer does every day that doesn't get a lot of attention because no one needs to get out a violin and toot their own horn. But I think the testament is the amount of staff with us who have been with us for over two decades is pretty outrageous. And when people are onboarded, you know, we hope that they are with us a long time and it's a very fruitful relationship. We always do every restaurateur wants to invest in their staff. So it's part of staff. You're nothing without your staff. So you couldn't do what needed to be done without them. So that's why during the pandemic, we went to extraordinary means to make sure that everybody was well taken care of. That's great. And, and we and still do. We, st we still do. Well, that's good. Every day. I, I, yeah. If after lockdown, you then fired everybody, that would be weird. Oh, we, we heard horror stories. I think after lockdown, there were many employees in the city who did not get their last paycheck. There were many employees who did not get their tips. Um, and, you know, it was just a chaos. So I think how we handled it, how we've always handled employees and their rights, and we see them as a part of the success of this business and they're irreplaceable. So we know how we operate as employers. And I think, um, speaks for itself. Yeah, that's great. And you also have a new oil that you're using. Um, that's kind of a weird segue, but I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, sustainable practices, whether that's maintaining your staff or maintaining the environment. So I want to learn about this oil that you're using. I guess it's derived from algae. What's, what's yes. the deal with that? So the Spotlight team has brought to our attention this beautiful product that we tested here and we love it. Um, it's, a, it's a local product that is um, really brilliant in the fact that it has tremendous properties that are super attractive to chefs, um, especially here in the Bay Area, since it's manufactured in Alameda. Um, and as a chef, you're always looking for the next, what, 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 how can I improve? So this was a really great opportunity to learn about this product and then um, test it and then be absolutely thrilled with its results. So we use it at the restaurant here daily. And uh, why it's so wonderful for us is not only the clean flavor of this oil, but, you know, knowing where it's coming from and how it's being produced makes us feel like we're part of a, a beautiful, uh, you know, circle of renewal and regeneration. And so organic fruit and vegetables and sustainable meat and properly sourced seafood has always been part of our entire careers that John and I have shared together. And so this oil really reflects that um, desire to um, have a beautiful product. So it helps us in multiple ways. It's actually a beautiful medium for multiple purposes. So do you use it for everything or some things or what is it best for this? this well, uh, we, we, um, 
we we do invest in lots of different oils here, so we'll have multiple different olive oils for certain different um, applications and in, in finishing and uh, building certain sauces. But this oil is um, not only is it a beautiful medium to fry things in, which is always so fun. We we love to fry food here. Uh, we love fried food. We love crisp textures. And so this oil gives a lot of uh, clean texture and a very botanical finish to things like uh, plantains that we might micro thin, slice, and then fry, and then accompany with a ceviche. It's also um, in our fryer the nights that we are doing fried chicken. Also... Um, We've got a couple of cakes that we're working on, a ginger cake and a chocolate cake using this oil, which makes it nice because if you're, you can do a cake that's completely vegan is always lovely for our vegan and vegetarian clientele. So we're sort of smitten with this product. It's also um, actually in a few of our cocktails that our bar manager, Brian, and Leo, our other bar uh, mem uh, manager, has have both developed uh, beautiful cocktails that are using this algae oil. And one of them is a uh, very uh, deeply ambered Manhattan that is got uh, algae oil wash and it kind of amplifies the spirit flavor, which is very beautiful. So you're always looking for an amplification of purity. So uh, also, a very special martini we do has that same application, and it also amplifies all the botanicals in various gins and vodkas that we use uh, here at Foreign Cinema. So the bar program certainly reflects the ethos of our food program, and this oil is a really wonderful ingredient to partner with and experiment with. It's very um, exciting because... Um, it gives us uh, something to look forward to when we're thinking about um, concocting new ideas. So it's it's very versatile. It, it's a beautiful uh, addition to our homemade hummus and uh, artichoke puree. Anything vegetarian or with you know chicken or fish, it is a is a beautiful product, especially to um, saute in. It's very clean, has a great smoking point. It's it's a very beautifully, perf it performs beautifully for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I think it's fun to know that it's produced right here, just 11 miles away. Yeah, Alameda is just across the, the bay, right? That's correct. So, so we're planning on taking a factory tour soon to um, see how it's produced because that's sort of the full circle and you can bring that to the audience and to the, the service team. It's really nice. So we'll probably have a combination of back of house and front of house people go on this tour, which I know will be very educational for us, especially in this world where sustainability and reducing your carbon footprint is so important. Well, it, it Sounds like you probably use a lot of local stuff. I mean, you guys have so much good stuff in the in the Bay Area and in, in the Central Valley, which isn't that far away. That you, you probably do you go on a lot of tours of farms and plants and like we that? do and wineries. I think wineries uh, are a great um, educational destination um, for restaurants to learn how we're producing. We have done a few um, farm trips with the whole team and. But yes, the Bay Area is completely blessed with uh, lots of beautiful resources, cheesemakers, um, uh, people raising uh, beautiful pork, uh, Lano Seco. Um, and we have a lot of different growers um, who have given us tours of their farm, um, farms from Santa Cruz Mountains to Salinas to um, Cape Hay Valley. Um, so it, it, this is why it's called California Mediterranean cooking is because we're able to use so many resources, you know, regionally, which make us feel so special and inspired. 
on your to your create menus. Setup. Right. Well, and the Bay Area is has a climate similar to the Mediterranean, which makes it. It really does. I think it's. Is it the same measurement? Is it is it is Spain the same? Um, I think right. we're on the same. Yeah, I think you, Spain and California and parts of Italy were all on that spectrum of positioning in this in the sun, and so our seasons are almost. Well, they're they're kind of the same in the sense that they're 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 mild. They can be mild. And year round, we just have super surprises in what is grown here. And so from artichokes to favas to, you know, hairy covert uh, to various fruit. I mean, just all year round, you're following, you know, what is available. And so uh, luckily, the Mission has a beautiful farmer's market right on the corner of 22nd and Mission. Uh, so we're there every Thursday, as well as a huge collective of farms farmers that we work with that we are so proud to be aligned with in Sonoma. So uh, it's a big, happy family. That's why during the pandemic, you know, so much was uh, affected. The entire cycles of production were just completely interrupted. And that took a long time to get back. In fact, I still feel like we're um, recovering from that absence of so much economic and agricultural uh, activity, you know, um, we're, we're still finding things that, that, you know, we, we don't have enough of, you know, they, they produce it and then we don't have enough because we, we lost so much momentum during 2020 and 2021 and just trying to get, you know, 2022 up and running. It didn't help that there was a war at the end of our pandemic launched on the other side of the world talk about, you know, sad news and it's just on, it's ongoing, you know, and then the Middle East, these things really affect us all. And so uh, we just try and remain hopeful and do what we can and um, support all the beautiful producers that are here. And I think it, I think a testament to our success is that you can feel that in the dining room when you come and uh, enjoy a meal here. And uh, so we're very proud of that. Well, and it's you not always mention, easy, but we're very proud. Nice going. But, and you forgot to mention the fires in 2020. That, that oh, my God. Had. Fires. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think we were still, um, you know, recovering from the fires in 2017 and 2018, uh, not to mention the fires in 2020. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of we've. I, I feel like we've just been through it all, but I don't want to say that because you never know what's coming down the pike, but these hard moments certainly make you stronger and a better business owner. And I think um, all the, my brothers and sisters in the restaurants um, are better operators for it. Um, you're either learning from it and becoming more resilient business owners while still maintaining your charitableness to communities and supporting them. But uh, it's been quite a journey and lots of stories. So many. The I public remember I... doesn't even know, you know, what you go through each day. Each day. Each I mean, day. I, rem I think it was the near the end of 2021, I was in Napa for the Worlds of Flavor Conference. And I went to a, a restaurant in Napa and the chef came out and I said, so... How, how have you been? And, you know, how have you adjusted? And he started talking about, you know, so we had to, you know, do help the the first responders and we had to, you know, change and sell, you know, groceries, all that sort of stuff. And he talked for about 10 minutes. And then he said, and then the fire started. And I was like, oh, and we're only in June of 2020. And, you know, so much that had to be adjusted to. And uh, it's heartrending. It's, it is. And I think it's a testament to humanity. And, you know, no one's, we're not trying to put out a violin, but I think, you know, restaurant to restaurant tours are, we're always the first responders to a disaster. Um, and then we had our own disaster where, you know, uh, you couldn't operate. So I do think that I have a tremendous amount of hope, you know, when you go through these hard times, uh, you are a more resilient person a more resilient business owner, 
a more uh, compassionate person. I feel like um, all we can do today is to be, you know, kind to one another and to be, you know, compassionate towards the world, which has now become smaller, you know, uh, even though thousands and thousands of miles away, there's complete suffering, you know, it affects us to where we are. And collectively, uh, it's just, it's just fundamental to me to have hope and to try and continue to do the good work of practicing uh, sustainability and hospitality and providing, you know, goodness in the world, just to provide goodness and to do good quality. And that, um, that is manifestation to the world. Um, it's all we can do. Yeah. And then the term restaurateur is French for someone who restores others. And, and that's what restaurants do. It's so true, isn't it? Absolutely. So Gail, what are you looking forward to for the next year? Oh, well, I think I, I'm looking forward to um, a big 25th anniversary party this year in September, where we will recreate the Moulin Rouge with entertainment, food, and esprit de corps, and music, and shenanigans for a really great um charity house uh, actually a nonprofit called Hamilton House and they do amazing work with homelessness uh, in keeping uh, families um, housed when they're in crisis so our parties each year uh, we don't do them every year but we do on certain years when we feel like we can make a big show of it we do uh, uh, raise money for amazing community members next uh, right here in this community. It's usually children based. Uh, it's usually education based. Uh, this year we've really um, narrowed it down to Hamilton House. And if you look them up, they do amazing, amazing care with keeping uh, families housed and on their way to full recovery uh, of just not in that cycle of, you know, getting temporary housing and then back on the street. So, and they have a really great success rate, uh, full of wonderful people who know all the right moves to keep young families, uh, housed and in school and on the right track for their futures. And so we're, we're going to support them. Hopefully we'll raise seventy thousand dollars for them so our, our party will be very fun that's in the fall and we're looking forward to just uh putting on a great show every night and the 25th year and celebrating this great city and it's getting back on its feet and um changing this false narrative and just trying to get stories of hope written um and hope and goodwill and good things uh, coming out of the city that I think the nation and the globe just doesn't get a chance to read about. So um, anyway, very hopeful for the future, hopeful for the country in this election year. I am exhausted from the, <laughs> the, the similar story that we're in uh, this year, but I, I am just, just grateful to be able to be in this business and to be in the town that I was born and raised in still here. And uh, uh, I'm a very proud native or, or born and raised San Franciscan. Well, and, and to have been running a restaurant for 25 years is not usual. So good job with that. Well, thank you. Yes, we've had our shares of uh, tumultuous ups and downs. And I think every time you, you can navigate through that, you are a better person person. You're a better navigator. You're a better business owner, a better employer. So um, sometimes those tough times define you. Um, and we, um, we like to look at it square on and be super creative and think of ways to navigate those moments. And I think, um, you know, the, it's really San Francisco is in a huge renaissance and you don't have a renaissance in 
great times. The Renaissance comes after uh, a great clearing and, and a great sense of um, restarting, which I think the city has gone through. And um, I'm just full of hope and I'm in gratitude for everything that we've built here and I don't take it for granted ever.